presentation on the concept for the organ project within the inaugural weekend for the new instrument and the organ festival 2021. We gather not in the concert hall uh, since a lot of the preparations had to be done under the, the, uh, the uh, restrictions that were held for Corona and COVID and the capacity of the concert hall and the staff there didn't allow for planning more events than the concert. So we collaborate with uh, the um, uh, School of Music here, Artisten, and uh, then we are pleased to be here in a room which is not just a lecturing hall. It is named after the professor of musicology, John Ling. It's the Ling Salen. And John Ling was instrumental in making the organ research develop the way it did in Gothenburg in the 1990s. So for me personally, having all these memories with Jan at our side, developing Go Art and so forth, it is a particular pleasure to be in this room this morning, giving the presentation on uh, the new instrument. And um, uh, Paul Peters is going to be the moderator for the morning. I think everything you need is the program book or the specification that we have on handouts here um, for your convenience during the presentation. Anybody needs the, the specification? Just to make sure you get that. Okay, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Hans. So, good morning also from my side. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Peters, and I'm also a member of the reference group and doing organ research, work with several projects. Uh, perhaps I should uh, present the people that are here. Uh, we need a little bit of improvisation this morning since not every member of the reference group can be here since they are practicing or have practiced all night, like Nathan, but he uh, made it even uh, here. So, yeah, we'll see. We, we made a kind of program, but we have to as I said, improvise a little bit. So, first of all, Wendelin Eberle, the director of Rieke. Uh, Georg Pfeiffer, uh, I think deputy, one could say. Mm -hmm. Stefan Niebler, uh, the head voicer and leader of the voicing team for the project. Uh, then we have Karen Nelson, you heard her uh, yesterday night, professor of organ here at the Academy of Music and Drama and in Oslo at the conservatory and known for her improvisations. Then we have Nathan Laube, uh, currently professor of organ in Stuttgart. Uh, he has been a professor at, of, of organ at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester and uh, uh, he is very experienced as a concert hall organist. Uh, I would say he has played so many different concert organs, concert hall organs. Hans Davidson, you know, project leader for the project and uh, artistic uh, director of the organ festival. Koos van der Linde, uh, also organist and harpsichordist, uh, but uh, mainly working as an organ consultant. Uh, he, has also, he has also worked as an organ builder and he has worked with a wide range of projects from medieval style organs until 19th century style organs. So first I would like to ask uh, Hans Davidson to uh, tell a little bit about the history of the project. Yeah, so five years ago we started the journey and I was invited to the um, director of the symphony orchestra, Stein Kranner, and uh, he said, uh, we would like to do something with our organ. And the instrument in the concert hall was built by Markusen in 1937, inaugurated. And um, 
the reason why Sten uh, Kranner invited me and wanted to discuss the possibility of doing something was an agreement that they had made with the owner of the building, the facilities, the company, real estate company Higab, that owns all of the cultural buildings in Gothenburg and, and takes care of them in different ways. And Higab had agreed that the organ could be viewed as part of the facilities, as part of the building, which meant they were prepared to pay to get the Matheson organ playing again. Uh, moreover, Sten Kranner told me um, our um, presidia of the boards of the symphony orchestra and HIGAP have formulated three questions. The first is, is it possible to restore the Marcus and organ to make it sound and play again? And if so, what would it cost? And then the third question was, if we were to do this, would we get an organ that would fulfill the requirements for a concert hall organ today? And uh, so we were, from the Organ Academy's point of view, uh, engaged in this uh, preparatory study. And, and before that, I should say that, that when I got the message and the question whether I would like to help with this, I said uh, nothing would be more interesting and important for me. However, I would not like to do that as an individual, not as an individual consultant. Because... Uh, everything we did with organ research in Gothenburg, everything that I learned through my life as an organist and, and organ researcher and, and organ project leader, is that I know what I know, and I know many things that I don't know, uh, but there are many things that I don't know that I don't know. And, you know, you can go on like that, and the simple truth is that with collective expertise, working together with people that know more than I do in many other fields, you have much more likelihood for success. And we could turn it into Jan, Ling ways, Jan Ling's way of describing this. Um, one should look at such projects, challenges, as an opportunity for research. And the research always asks for collective expertise. So my condition was, I'll do everything I can for this project, but we have to form an international reference group and we have to apply the model that was developed in different places, but also in Göteborg, to work with the best builders and the reference group together uh, to try to, to, to do something which is more than we otherwise would get, uh, to, to meet the expectations <coughs> so, uh, of the function of, of an instrument of this kind in the best possible way. Back to the preparatory study. The answers from six individual internationally uh, 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 international organ builders working both with restorations, new building renovations that visited the Marcuson organ during the next few months uh, independently was that they uh, uh, saw that it would be possible to restore the organ, it would be possible to do it for almost as much money as it would cost to build a new instrument and uh, then the third question, would it fulfill the requirements of what our expectations of a concert organ today, uh, everybody answered no. It would make the instrument sound like it did in the 1930s when the orchestra uh, had 60 members and it would sound according to its physical conditions which was too much organ in a small space with an, a, an arrangement in the room that didn't allow for the sound to get out in the hall. It was a, an impossible task. The instrument was built of highest uh, quality. The craft and everything was the highest ambition. However, the time when it was built with a builder who had no experience of building a concert hall organ and the uh, task was to build the largest organ in the Nordic countries in a space that didn't allow for it, that led to improvisations in the installation that made the sound not come into the hall and so forth made the answer on this question simply be no. It would not fulfill the requirements of the concert hall organ. So the recommendation from the reference group that had been formed in this process, had studied the proposals, independent proposals from six builders, was that we should go ahead and build a new instrument. Uh, at the same time, the Marcuson organ from 1937 is one of the few well-preserved instruments of its kind from that time and represents both 
a cultural historical value and as a music instrument definitely an important value if it would be placed and put in a situation where the sound could develop. So dismantle that instrument, take care of it carefully, try to find another home for it. And it is it was the first summer of the project that the organ was dismantled by Rieger that had been chosen as the builder unanimously by the reference group in this competition that we had. And, and um, the, um, the choice was based on the fact that you had a proposal that convinced us very much for a successful concert hall organ in the Gothenburg Concert Hall. And that was in 2018 and the journey began for planning, study trips with the reference group, discussions, both in, in, uh, yeah, in Europe, different places, Paris, Kassel, and then here in Gothenburg, and also study trip to Cavecol instruments uh, in Rouen and Caen. And um, yeah, uh, a relationship that uh, offered us opportunities for, for um, refining the concept that you had proposed and discussing the direction of everything that we wanted this instrument to be and to do. And uh, yeah, this was a process which um, I think uh, helped us to uh, step by step define more precisely and share the vision for the project that we had had from the beginning. When we started, the positions were a little bit different, the concept was clear, but we had to do this uh, uh, process, we had to come more and more to uh, practical terms how we could do these different uh, aspects uh, in, the, in the project. Many challenges appeared uh, during the project. Uh, you saw yesterday we have two consoles, one mechanical and, and one uh, movable, as we say, with digital, digital um, uh, transmission and also proportional key action, which was a new device developed by Riga in, during the project time. But uh, that was one of the challenges where we, uh, yeah, we're going to tell you more about it today here. How we had other challenges like getting the sound out of the organ room. There were no shutters at that time. There were panels that fortunately somebody had installed because they thought it would help the orchestra to hear what was going on, uh, reflecting the sound, helping the hearing, which probably was the case. So they had installed horizontal panels that were angled, and this was done to this historical building in the early 2000s. That meant that the protected culturally mon monument building uh, had been changed in recent years, so the secondary alterations that had been made could be uh, uh, changed. We could do something else with it. So we had a process of getting the needs for a successful instrument, both with the podium wall, with general swell, and the canopy uh, that we had to run by the um, uh, regional uh, preservation authorities. Uh, so many challenges of this kind, technical, musical, and with the building, and so we were faced with and worked together with. And we're going to tell you a little bit about that step by step today. So, as an introduction, uh, I think that should be sufficient. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Hans. And as you have seen, uh, Hans Ola has been able to join us mm -hmm. now for um, some time. For the rest. Oh, for the rest, that's great. I thought you needed to leave, I guess. I think great. Have case um, so, what type of organ did we want to have? That was of course, a very important question. And as you all know, the 19th century is the period where the concert hall organs developed. And one could very generally say that uh, in Europe it developed in this way that we got the French style organ, a German style organ, and an English style organ. Um, for us, it was very important to create a clear musical identity that of a late 19th century symphonic organ, an instrument that would form a complete and harmonious whole. And we chose Aristide Cavier Cole's style from around the 1880s as a base for the Grand Orgue, the Positive, the Récit, 
and the pedal. The positive and the C are both enclosed, as was the case at that time with cardiac organs. And to that we added an orchestral division called orchestre, which is also enclosed with, you could say, a combination of German and English American style stops. Then we have a floating division solo, also enclosed, and the bombarde with high pressure stops. They are, so to speak, borrowed from the orchestra, but we have as an extra a trompet en chamade, which you can see, which is inside the organ, but which is placed uh, horizontally. And the number of stops of the orchestra and solo can also be played in the pedal. Uh, Cavier Goldstein from around the 1880s also formed the base for the voicing of the organ. And this complete and harmonious whole of a late 19th century French symphonic organ is now accompanied and contrasted by the German and English American style stops of the orchestra and the solo and bombarde. We have a number of unconventional features. Hans has already uh, mentioned uh, a few of them. We have a general swell in the back wall. We have two consoles. We have three different type of actions. We have a mechanical console with tracker key action. The stop action is electrical from that console. Then we have an electrical console with digital action, which is an action that when you press the key down, the pallet opens, and when you release it, the pallet closes. So it's on off, to say it uh, a little bit uh, basic. And then there is a proportional action, key action system, and also stop action system. It's especially developed by Rieger, and it works like this. If you uh, push down the key, the pallet will follow exactly the movement of the key. So it is not all off, but if you do it slowly, the pallet will open slowly as in a mechanical console, uh, a key action. And um, we had a very special challenge, and that was for the uh, mechanical console. Uh, it could not be in place there all the time. So it had to be possible, made possible to lower its position and to bring it up again. But you can imagine that when you have a mechanical key action, this is not easy. So Rieger again, developed something new, which is unique in the world, I think. There is no system we know of that it makes possible to have a mechanical key action where you can uh, lower down the console and bring it up again. We can come back to these things also later. Then we have a set of two wooden pedal stops, a Grand Boudon 32 and a Gross Flute 16, both with a span of one and a half octave, and these pipes are placed underneath the floor in the audience part of the hall. And it was developed after an acoustical uh, research study was carried out by uh, Professor Emeritus Mendel Kleiner from Chalmers, Jan Inge Gustafsson, and Alf Berenson, uh, Alf Berenson from Artifone Company in Göteborg. Uh, and this was also a very a special project, we don't know either about um, such a device somewhere else in the world. Uh, it was very important for us to enhance the very low frequencies. It's all, always difficult in a concert hall to get those uh, low frequencies work well and, and uh, have uh, enough uh, weight, so to speak. Then we have a flexible wind pressure for the Grand Orgue, which goes from about 0 to 160 millimeters. We have a saxophone 8-foot stop on the Grand Orgue, also developed by Riga. It is um, an open wood, wooden flue pipe with a stopped wooden backpack resonator, could you say, containing a free reed. 
For the receive, we have two different modes of the felt shutters opening. Uh, nowadays, when you build uh, enclosed divisions, you can do that in such a way that uh, the pianissimo is really very pianissimo. You don't almost hear anything. And the fortissimo is, of course, very loud. In the 19th century, the range was somewhat smaller. When the pianissimo is a little bit louder pianissimo as in the modern uh, swell boxes. So in order to have the possibility to adjust that in the concert when playing 19th century music, uh, you can choose that uh, different mode. The swell pedals, we have not less than seven of them, you can change the order of them. Uh, so it's very convenient for the player if uh, you have a certain piece or if the player uh, prefers uh, a certain uh, uh, pedal to be in a certain position, you can change them. We have four register crescendi, we have four free adjustable couplers, uh, we have Riga's replay system, MIDI and sostenuto, and you have seen uh, yesterday evening the LED lights with different colors inside the organ, and uh, we have prepared for, they are not yet in the organ, percussion stops. And um, all of the information, if you look in your specification, it's uh, listed there. Um, I propose that we uh, take a short look inside the organ. We have made a video walkthrough, which uh, takes about uh, uh, 10 minutes, and uh, then you can get a better impression also of uh, what is inside mm -hmm. the organ. Nu öppnar vi den andra dörren in i orgeln med 9000 typer som vi ligger på orgelbar i Österrike och Lyckstås. Så vi kommer in i orgelhuset där vi har eh, lite mekanik på olika delar men också eh, sambandscentralen med elektronik, kombinationssystem. Det är ju klassiskt handverk i tradition men också ny teknologi. Och vi går upp och in i den bakre delen av orgelrummet. När vi blickar runt här så ser vi att det är ett stort rum och tegelväggar, betong i taket. Och vi hör, kanske ni hör också, att fläkten, fläktarna, det är faktiskt fyra stycken, de går en luft i väljarna i reservoarerna till exempel här. Ett bord med stenar som vikter, som reglerar lufttrycket och som liksom står här som en reservoar just för beredda att släppa in luft i hela pitverket. Nu är vi på högsta nivån och det är när man kommer upp så där lite över ögonhöjd så man ser de här stora piperna. Det är de som ger de djupaste tonerna i orgen, ner åt 20 Hz. Subbas 32, de ligger på och de delarna i piperna som ger tonen finns längst fram, ska vi se. Här har vi två stycken dörrar. Vi öppnar dem och går in här. Och då ser vi, här ser vi pitverket alltihop i den tredje utav orglarna inne i orglrummet, resivverket. i eh, något som är ja, symmetriskt, en spegelbild eh, utav resmen. Och det är det är som man spelar från andra klaviaturer. Det finns fyra klaviaturer eller manualer som vi säger. Och här ser man att det finns, precis som på andra sidan, långa piper som har plats för sig. Det är djupare, mer höjd i den delen av oljehuset här. Och här uppe står det skrivpiper. Och de har faktiskt olika lufttryck med. Hela orgen är byggd enligt den filosofi som Aristide Cavaycol på 1800-talet utvecklade med vetenskapsakademier och sitt främsta tänkande att optimera lufttryck och en annan sak som vi ska titta på speciellt, de här luckorna som finns. De 
kammar öppna och stänga. Och då reglerar man julivån förstås. Så starkare, svagare och man kan alltså ha väldigt mycket dynamisk variation i en symfonisk orgel. Och det är ju grundkaraktären i vårt instrument. Vi vandrar ner. Och på vägen ner så ser vi de här stora piperna som heter Bombarde 32. Och det är då piper som klingar med en metalltunga i mässing som vi kan se genom plexiglas här. Och när de klingar då så gör luften så att det blir, eh, den här tungan oscillerar. Och det bildar en ton då som förstärker liksom den långa träuppsatsen. Det är de starkaste djupa tonerna. Vi talade om fem orglar i orgelhuset. Nu har vi sett två. Nu ska vi se det tredje. Och det är den del av orgeln som man spelar från den fjärde manualen. Det kallas för orkesterverket. På väg in ser vi mekanik. När man trycker ner en tangent så rör sig en mekanisk förbindelse. Så att man öppnar ventiler under piporna. Här inne har vi de poetiska karaktärsstämmorna här framme. Och vi ser luckor, stora luckor, mycket dynamiska möjligheter. Och i bakre delen av detta ordhus så har vi tubakören och högtrycksstämmen. En French horn, fransk horn. Och det är faktiskt originaltypet från den amerikanska orgelbyggaren Ernst Skinner. Och de tillverkades på 1930-talet. Och vi har köpt dem till den här orgeln från USA, från historiska orglar som då inte längre finns på plats. Och det är en fantastisk kvalitet på dem också. Mörkare klangfärger och kompletterar väldigt fint brasskören i vår orgel. Alla trumpetstämmer i olika oktavlägen som finns. Så går vi fram från den bakre delen med tre orglar in i den fjärde och femte. Den främre delen av orgelhuset. Här ser vi att det finns höjd. Alla piper i den största verken kan stå rätt upp utan att vara klokta. Huvudverket säger det på svenska, eller Grand Org, den stora orgen i den franska terminologin. Och högst upp om vi tittar ser vi eh, de där jättepiperna i trä, Subas 32. Och på vägen upp ser vi de här ja, horisontella metalluppsatserna. Det är eh, shamad, alltså den horisontella trumpeten. Orgens eh, mest peppriga så att säga rörvägsstämma trumpet. På sidorna, om vi tittar här borta, så har vi den femte av orgelarna. Pedalen, det som man spelar med fötterna. Och det är de längsta piperna, de vidaste, man surna, de starkaste tonerna. Och den är fördelad på två sidor. Så där har man lite pingpong-effekt mellan de här delarna. Och jag står precis eh, i en dörr. Där vi kan se fläktarna till just den här främre delen av borgen. Mekanik på vägen. Och en reservoir in till fläktlådan där vi har högljusfläktar. Och här finns en ny möjlighet att variera lufttrycket så man kan få svaga skimrande klanger och högre lufttryck kan man önska genom att köra denna viktvagnen på rälsen här. Något som är experimentellt och spännande för de här klangerna som man inte har hört innan. Vi ser en träpipa, eller en, en stämma som vi säger, en familj med klanger här. Och det är den här saxofonstämman som faktiskt har två piper för varje ton. En uppfinning för vår orgel, ett försök att skapa en sådan orkesterstämma. Nu öppnade jag de stora General Swell-lockerna. 
Det är något som är väldigt speciellt för vår olja. Man kan, man kan så att säga spela med oljens fulla verk och stänga till och öppna. En grandios dynamisk effekt. Som, ja, det första gången sedan 1920-talet man använde den idén i ett konserthus oljebygge. Och det är förbrid aktivitet här nere nu för att lyfta upp det mekaniska spelandet. Det första i orgelbyggnadshistorien som är höj- och sänkbart. den där sjätte delen, där vi har baspiper, en orgel under parkettgolvet i konsertsalen. För att komma in i sjätte delen av orgeln så får vi gå genom Götaplats foyer och in, liksom ett bakhåll, in mot parkettgolvet under konsertsalen. Här brukar inte någon komma in, så det, det är lite tråkigt. Här har vi en ny dörr och ett nytt hål in i... Och här har vi 40 pipor. De största i trä som liksom har en systerpipa och de stämmerna här under golvet. 20 stycken i två stämmor, subbas 32 och då frut 16 öppen. Och de ligger här, så 20 stycken ser vi riktade mot oss med en fläkt längst bort. Så det finns en egen luftförsel här. Och sen ligger de andra 20 piperna åt andra hållet. Så det innebär att hela, ja, en tredjedel drygt av hela parkett har den här basorgen under fötter. Man känner, man hör de låga frekvenserna tack vare denna first ever <går> i konserthussammanhang och överhuvudtaget i orgelvärlden då byggda basorgen. Tack vare att det är hål under varje stol så går ju klangen upp. Det är som en, lite som en slitsost och resonansbotten på en gång. Så, så det är härligt att kunna känna och höra de låga frekvenserna. for the Swedish. <laughs> this was meant to, we did this video just before the integration here, but you could see at least the interior of the instrument and, and the different parts, including the base pipes at the end here, were placed, are placed under the package. And something that everybody says who has the opportunity to go into the organ is that it, it, it has the, the aesthetic of a living room. You get in there and you feel that it's, it's solemn somehow. It's, it's such a refinement, such a fantastic um, craft um, and, and atmosphere in your work that is um, yeah, admirable in every possible way. Sorry. So the uh, next uh, point on the program is uh, some short statements of members of the reference group and I would like to ask uh, Nathan to tell something yeah. that is special from uh, your perspective. I have to go over and practice in a few moments so I'll try to be brief. Um, I think when we were conceptualizing just what should be present in the organ, we've already wonderfully established the concept of having the spirit of Kava Ekol as the kind of core of the instrument. But uh, one of the things that I think we all thought about a lot, and I spent a lot of time thinking about, was 
also what was happening in the late 19th century, a time of unprecedented travel and sharing of knowledge among organ builders, also thanks to big events like World's Fairs, at which French organ builders were building organs for London, in which uh, um, German and French organ builders were exhibiting organs in the USA, um, et cetera, et cetera. And where, for example, organ builders in the USA were importing French reeds, and uh, organ builders in France were occasionally importing English reeds, um, et cetera. There was a lot of knowledge sharing, and there was a lot of cross-pollination. And I think nowadays, after a century of a lot of in investigation into performance practice traditions, we're often been, we've been very fixated for a long time on sort of purebred organs. Uh, a very pure cabaret coal concept, or a very pure Volker concept, or a very pure, uh, whatever it might be, instrument. And sometimes at the expense of not looking at instruments in which, in fact, we see a very uh, synthetic design. Um, for example, when sometimes German organ builders would build organs in France, they would modify their concepts, and vice versa. Um, and this is, I thought, would be an interesting place to explore what the fourth manual of this organ could be. There was an interesting book that I spent a lot of time reading by Jean Huret called L'Esthétique de, de, de l'Orgue from 1923, in which he talks about what he perceives as a stagnation in France, that France has not kept up with the times by 1923, and we're still building organs in 1923 like we've been building for the last hundred years. And, uh, and why are we not including stops with high pressure? Why, are we not in, why do we limit ourselves to a very small dynamic range compared to what's now being done in America or in England or in, in Germany, etc., etc.? And I thought maybe this was a chance within the concept of a French organ to realize some of these ideas from Jean Huré, for example, where he asked for very, very soft stops, where he asked for very, very powerful stops, where he asked for all of these colors which he already had visited in other parts of the world and bring them together, but not in, in the way of a normal eclectic organ where you have a part of the organ which is for German music, a part of the organ which is for French music, etc., but one that is fully integrated in a large symphonic concept. So the idea with the fourth manual is to include these uh, chiaroscuro stops from, that we find in 19th century German instruments, but which you also find in plenty of 19th century French instruments, just not the most famous ones. Um, or from other builders who were competitors of Cave Ecole, like Puget or like Merclin, um, and, and lesser known builders also in the south of France, for example. Um, and then to, to see where, who were builders, for example, in England who were very influenced by French organ design, like Gray and Davison, someone we never hear about anymore, but who uh, often built French-style stops and very interesting uh, municipal organs with, for example, French reeds in them, not traditional English reeds, etc., etc., etc. And where even could these famous orchestral sonorities typical of early 20th century American organs possibly fit into that, when now that has also become a part, more increasingly, of uh, instruments built in concert halls and just in general in Europe. For example, some of these Skinner or Kimball or Austin sonorities, very orchestral strings with narrow scales. Um, French horn stops have become uh, as common as voix humaine now uh, in, in modern large instruments. Um, and this was another opportunity then perhaps even to find some uh, vintage pipe work, uh, which I was able to locate from Skinner, um, from an organ that formerly had been in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, where we were able to secure a, a beautiful French horn and a tuba. So, um, yeah, so I think this was, this was a little bit the spirit of the fourth manual um, as an extension of the ideas put forth in the 19th century and that, for example, builders like uh, Mutin began, Mutin built French horns Unfortunately, there are none left. We would love to know what a Mutin French horn sounded like, but maybe if Mutin ever heard a Skinner French horn, he, he would have appreciated this. And that's also the name of the stop. The Cour d'Harmonie is uh, one possibility for what the, uh, the French horn was. That's also, by the way, an interesting, unique stop that has uh, a, a double function um, in the Skinner or Aeolian or uh, Kimball tradition, the French horn stop, um, has reeds basically into the top octave, uh, and then it goes into flues. 
but of course the French horn in the orchestra itself is not a stop which plays um, in the top two octaves of the keyboard. Uh, rather, it's really a treble and mid-range stop, which gives this particular color and has this particular sort of bubble this bulb at the beginning of the, of the speech. And um, it's a stop that Dupre and Vierne very much admired when they came to the States in their tours in the 1920s, and, uh, and a stop that they wished to have in organs then when they went back to France, but never actually had realized. I think only one or two Mutin French horns were ever built. Um, but the top part of the stop is always sits silent. It's always a kind of useless part of the stop. So we thought here would be an excellent opportunity then to have the big orchestral flute of the organ, which takes over where the French horn uh, becomes kind of useless. And so in this way, it's almost like the, the, the cornet. It has a, a function uh, in, in two different parts of the keyboard, like in the grand jeu or something. And so this is um, uh, a little bit the concept there. But I don't know if that... More or less, I think. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a little bit the idea. And then the possibility to separate out these stops so that you can use them in different places. So not all of these stops, which occupy the, the widest dynamic range from, range from the Eolina to the Shavad, are in one place so that you only can use one at a time. But they're available in different places so that you can assign them to different keyboards at will and use the organ in the most flexible way. Floating divisions. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That was a very nice explanation. Thank you very much. So that I'll uh, leave you. Then. Yes. Yeah. Good luck. Uh, we will continue uh, with more of these statements a little bit later. I first now would like to uh, ask Rieger uh, to tell a little bit from their perspective <laughs> um, how this project has been for them. There were many, many challenges, and it is really unbelievable, I think, that they have managed to get the organ done in time with the pandemic. You can imagine what that might have caused for problems. And of course, there were many challenges and there were many extra things to be done that were not planned from the beginning, and even those were realized. Please. I can make it very short. <laughs> We just built what, what the expert group asked for. <laughs> <laughs> now, indeed, there have been many challenges, uh, but most of them are explained already. I think uh, we faced a lot of difficult uh, situations here, starting with the mobile, uh, with the with the attached console, with the mechanic console. And uh, we had to find uh, different solutions, which we haven't done before for various uh, things. And uh, it was not, not everything was clear from the beginning. So we, we started planning, and then we faced different uh, challenges and, and tried to solve them. So there's not very much to say about it. Uh, you showed them more or less. Uh, Already, so. Or you can say a lot about that, but uh, it just struck me one of these things that you are not aware of. But uh, to to uh, the, the to build these the general swell, for example, mm. we yeah. made a trip. I think the the first thing was to find a, a a proper solution for the whole ensemble. How to place the divisions? Yeah. Uh, you said at the beginning too much organ in too little space uh, for the Markerson organ. We built the same size of organ within less space than Markerson used. Markerson used the whole depth of the of the um, the organ chamber, which is about more than seven meters. Now we used for the pipe work we used about five meters. That's why you have seen a lot of empty space behind the organ. That was originally used by Markerson for for the swell division, which was very far back. So we tried to bring all the pipe work forward, and uh, that combined with a general swell, uh, I think that's a very important part of, of this instrument now, it's, uh, gives a very good dynamic range. We, we have three individual swell divisions, which are pretty effective, and then the general swell as an uh, overall swell. 
and uh, all these wells can be used independently but also on, on one swell shoot together they can be stored in the combination system and so on so they are very useful I think but the, we, we worked very closely so that the um, to, to have the general swell which wasn't part of the project we had to take the uh, directors of the orchestra and of HIGAP to Paris and to show mm. the organ in La Philharmonie mm. which uh, by definition had to have such shutters because it was not intended to be there at all and they had to place it somewhere where the architect could accept to have it high up and you had to build doors mm. yeah, as well for it. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the opportunity for us to get these people who made the decisions to understand what we could do. And we really had to fight for each in a single shutter yeah. to get more and more <laughs> space. <you know? laughs> that was really very difficult. Yeah. Uh, so this and then was, uh, finally we also were asked to build the, the whole canopy. That's something, it wasn't mentioned so far, but that's also done with the organ by our company. And that's a huge space above the... Uh, yeah, and I must say, uh, in this process, you know, uh, if you, when you deal with projects, you know, you bring an idea forward, you say this would be really important, you know, and then you have to explain why and you do, but then finally the question comes, how much is it going to cost? If, and if you can't tell that, and if it's not reliable, you will not succeed. And I can tell you, a train ride, I think, from Kassel, and, and down to southern Germany, during that train uh, trip, during our study trip, when we discussed the concept, I asked Wendelin, could you please calculate what would it cost to make the general swell in Göteborg? And when we arrived <laughs> in southern Germany to, to see the, the um, uh, Walke organ uh, in Hoffenheim, then you had the calculation made. You had the experience and you had the, the courage and experience in combination to make it possible to present reliable you know, cost estimates for things that you know, otherwise would be impossible. So for me as a project leader, to have that uh, <coughs> possibility meant just the difference between failure and success. So thank you. <laughs> to give you an idea about one of the challenges with the, uh, mobile, uh, with the, with the uh, attached console, the space between the visible wooden wall and the concrete wall where we could run the trackers is about 18, 17 centimeters. So that's all we had. That's a, like this. Yeah, actually it's 17, but uh, there are 12 centimeters left for, for us. Yeah. And that means within these 12 centimeters we have to run all the five uh, divisions and uh, plus the mechanics for the adjustment of the height. The console moves about 1.4 meters and it's lowered down. So there you had to use other materials than yeah, we, the we did trackers. That, yeah, yeah, with flexible materials and uh, not wooden trackers. Part of it is wooden trackers in the organ, you could see that. But the flexible part is made with uh, modern materials. Yeah. New functional materials based on the graphic research and things, you know, but very... Don't sturdy. tell too much. No. <laughs> 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 but of course, these new inventions, they, they are very interesting, and also I'm thinking... Yeah, probably we can sell it again. So. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm thinking, for example, of the saxophone. Perhaps you could tell a little bit more about the idea, how you came to that idea, and about the proportional uh, key action. We haven't spoken yet, but that is something that uh, Hans Holder can bring up, the proportional stop action. But perhaps the saxophone and, and the proportional key action. Yeah, we, with the saxophone, we, the idea was, or well, let's start in a different way. There are saxophones in America and, and other big organs around the world, but they are made as um, free reeds, only free reeds. And we thought a real saxophone has the 
possibility to be very silent, very soft, and it can be very brutal and rude if it's really loud. And so it has, I think it's one of the instruments which has the biggest uh, variety of sounds. And um, so we, we aimed for, for, for that goal to have a, an ins uh, a stop which can be very silent and it kind of rude. And we have the possibility on the grade with this flexible wind system. So we can lower the wind down to uh, almost uh, zero or zero uh, millimeters wind pressure up to 160. So the, the standard pressure is 95. So the uh, ground org is wise on 95. But we have this range. And we saw this as an opportunity for the saxophone uh, if it's used in combination as a solo stop in combination with this flexible wind system. Uh, if we just use it with 30, 40 millimeters, it should be very soft, very silent. And it changes its color if you go up to 130, 160 millimeters. And we didn't find a way to do this with just one single uh, kind of stop. So we, we thought, okay, the, the silent part could be, we need a flute to make sure there is a stable sound. And added uh, a free reed, which uh, becomes a little bit more aggressive with a higher wind pressure. So we have this uh, possibility to change the color within the stop in combination with the um, wind uh, pressure. flexible wind pressure, yeah. so that was so we did a lot of tests and yeah, it took us a while, but finally we came up with this solution and uh, the expert group thought, okay, it's worth to continue with that, and so we installed it finally. So that decision was made very late, I think, in mm -hmm. in June this year or so. So that yeah. just before we came over the. Last for the last step, uh, like the the 32 foot underneath the, it was also a very late decision. Uh, what was the second question? Proportional, yeah, proportional action. Yeah. Proportional action. Yeah, we are not the first one which, who started with uh, with the idea of proportional actions, but uh, there are two other companies who do this uh, kind of action already. It's installed in a few instruments, but it's, in our opinion, that was not satisfactory. Uh, even the expert group said, okay, now, if it's like this, we don't need it. So we, we thought uh, we develop our own system. The whole um, electronic system is, is developed by our company. And so that was one further step to develop a, a system which really follows the finger. If you press the key, without any delay the um, the motors open the valve and uh, we can we can go to speed by up to 12 uh, I'd say repetitions uh, what is the English name I don't know yeah. uh, per second and uh, so yeah it's very fast and it's it can be very soft and very slow <coughs> yeah thank you Another f challenge which we haven't talked about yet uh, is also it took a long time to build the organ but one of the problems was that the concert hall was only available during summertime. So Rieger could only be here and work in the concert hall, build up the organ in, during all these several summers that we have had. And then of course uh, at the end when the voicing comes in um, you need all the time and the voices have done a great job they have worked in in two shifts uh, two groups and uh, spent many night hours in the organ as have done others uh, from <laughs> the rigor company so these are of course also very uh, extra special challenges and, and don't make building such an organ easier than it would be otherwise. I don't know whether uh, you want to tell something about the voicing work, uh, some experiences you made, uh, difficulties from uh, the organ hall uh, or the concert hall as, as an acoustical room. 
Yes, for us, for us voices, it's I think a big, a big thing. The 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 so to to create the cover we call late sound in a dry concert space. That's a very different difference to a cathedral like the late style of cover we call. The cathedral do something from for alone, but the concert uh, space don't do alone. Uh, don't create the sound more or get the sound more. And that's for us was it's a big, uh, a big was a big way to create the, the a, a, a difference for the power. We need a big power at, at the concert space because we the organ play also with the orchestra and such other things. And also to create a very soft and relaxed sound like the sound of Cabaret called the late sound. That was for us a big challenge. big challenge, yes. Okay, thank you. Something more that you would like to add? Later on. Later on. Later on. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you have heard that we have been working with a reference group, and perhaps Hans can tell a little bit about how this group has worked and what the ideas have been uh, to work with such a group. Well, the, the, um, in order to, to facilitate communication between huh? people living in different spaces, and, and um, countries and so forth, you have to, to have some kind of uh, process order. And we decided to have two meetings, two physical meetings per year. So one in the spring, and when the organ started to be built in Schwarzach with Rieger, and then one in the fall uh, in Gothenburg. And uh, at the first such meeting, we also had a presentation of, of the project um, as a process. Uh, and in addition to this, we had Skype meetings uh, when uh, questions, challenges appeared to keep everybody abreast with the development, with the difficulties, the things that we needed to decide. And, and uh, by combining physical meetings in this way with uh, digital meetings, I think we were in contact all the time through the project so everybody could contribute and feel involved in the decision making and follow and support rigor in the challenges that appeared uh, as we went through, when extras needed to be done, when we need to provide arguments, for example, for the, for the base organ, the division, that it, it cost almost a million Swedish crowns to build that, which is not much if you think about it anyway, but, you know, of course you need strong arguments uh, to, uh, for the steering committee of the project. So all the time there was this very good dialogue involvement support from the reference group with the Riga team to manage with all these aspects as we went along. Everything was uh, uh, documented in minutes, uh, so the discussion is possible to follow. Um, uh, it is not, nothing that we at this point are going to publish, but it's, it's documented in that way that um, all this, the discussions we had, which sometimes you know took a lot of energy and, and to understand and challenges that we didn't know how to solve, then solutions that we found, sometimes different, let's say, um, uh, interpretations of, of, of what we were looking at, what we were aiming at, where we had to find common ground. Uh, it's always in a family, so that you sometimes, uh, you are, you're part of the family, you work together, and you have sometimes a little bit of struggles and quarrels and things, but you find your uh, common ground and, and can establish that. And I think we, we managed very well in the process of this project to do so. And I would like to say that at the beginning, when we invited six builders to give uh, um, uh, tenders on this project, restoring, renovating, or building new organ, it was also very clearly said that this project will be done in such a way uh, that we have a reference group and, and a research approach to it. So it is a condition and we are very interested to hear uh, how the builders look at this. And it was very clear from our first meeting uh, that uh, Rieger saw this as an opportunity. And I think we've had a very constructive uh, dialogue all through the project with the expertise, the excellence of, of our reference group members being involved in the project together with you. Yeah, thank you, Hans. Um, may I ask uh, Karen Nelson to uh, 
say something from her point of view about the organ and the possibilities of the instrument. Yes, I would like to say something about my experience about, uh, uh, for instance, uh, improvise. Uh, an organ of this, uh, which is so big, standing in a concert hall, it's a little like an orchestra, you know, a big, big orchestra where we had the different sessions of strings, we had a wooden instruments, we had a brass. So it's more like a group of, of uh, instruments. But I think it's so fantastic to hear this organ and play it, play the organ, because it, it has that also, it has this big group sound really loud. But it also has some strong personalities in, in uh, other kind of stops. For instance, yesterday I, I used octa four and flute four on the grate, and I thought that was so fantastic, beautiful. And I think that's unusual, actually, uh, that one are able to to find this personality in, in different stops. And uh, saxophone, of course. I, I, I actually made it a little more dirty, adding half uh, drawn nasat, I think, from the pussy So it's, it's a lot of um, possibilities. Of course, I'm looking forward in the future to, to discover it even more, and uh, with the flexible wind and so on, because it, it's so many possibilities with that. Uh, and also the sustain function which you will hear if you come to the concert tomorrow evening, Madeleine Isaacson. Uh, she has written a piece, Span, where she used that effect a lot. And of course, that is also something one can develop a lot and use in improvisation. So that's possible to do on, on uh, all the, uh, the keyboards. Um, what more can I say? Yeah, the, of course, the, the box, swell boxes, and the general uh, shutters, the shutters. That's so amazing. Uh, I used that yesterday also. Uh, one could, I had everything closed from the beginning, and then I added stops. And one really, it was just like a conductor uh, having the orchestra playing from piano pianissimo to uh, loudness. But I feel like in that crescendo one couldn't really hear that it added strong stops. It was, it's a fantastic effect to have everything closed and then in the end one can just open up. And also one can see it visual. Uh, one see, when one sit in the audience, one see this. So it's both from the eyes point of view and also the ears. So I, I think it's a lot to, to discover in the future, and it is a very inspiring instrument to play at. So, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Uh, Hans Ola, would you like to continue in telling something about the uh, experimental <coughs> things that are in included in the organ? Sure, I would love to. Um, first of all, within a concept, like this as a, a romantic concept, um, could one add experimental features? Would that go against the idea as such? It's something that can definitely be discussed uh, because the organ here is capable of changing its language completely. Uh, but there are things developed uh, by Rieger or by other organ builders also before then. But in this concept, included in, in such a refined way, um, not only on the mechanical console, but thanks to the possibility of having um, of having two different actions. So you can have a, um, two different kind of stop actions, for example. So you can, you can pull stops microtonally. Each individual stop that is not electrically uh, managed, of course. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so this is something I did with an organ builder in Sweden already 25 years ago, <clears throat> that you could pull a registration, as we said before, half ways. But of course it's much more complex than half ways. You can go from, from zero to full sound, and there are many, many steps. But the, the thing that has developed over time is that you can store it, and you can also get it back next day when you come. So when I did it 25 years ago in the School of Music in Piteå, I could set a microtonally pulled uh, stops, but the next day, because of humidity changed or, you know, things changed, you wouldn't get the same sound, which was, of course, really very bothering. <laughs> but here, it is, it is done with perfection. So complex sounds over the days, in any case, now when I rehearse, perhaps <coughs> it will change with humidity. We will see. It's a lively instrument. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you guys always say. Instrument. The instrument is alive. You will, change, you will change and the instrument will change. <laughs> so if you can imagine, each stop can be set perhaps in 30 steps. This gives, of course, the number of mechanical stops times 30. So the, the, the possibilities are endless. Or just if you want to have a shade of a sound, a little, little bit more treble, perhaps a little bit off touch, you know, a little bit out of tune, or very much. A reed, a slow speaking reed, strangled. There are beautiful sounds that you can create it's like having a, an enormous color possibility and you mix the colors, the white with a little gray with a little silver or whatever, and you can create amazing sounds. So this is something that I think is, uh, is an important part for contemporary music, for the classical music. I mean, I will play Volumina tomorrow and I make use of these possibilities and um, of course one can do perhaps even more in contemporary music. Volumina is, is historical music. And you will hear some tonight also in the piece I'm playing. Um, that's one thing which I, would, which I would love to highlight. The second thing is of course the rich possibilities when it comes to overtones. So that we have, we don't only have the, the fourth and the third, but we go to the septim, the known, and even higher. Uh, with, with a bell-like, uh, beautifully voiced uh, uh, sound quality. Um, I mean, I still think that there are, there are visions how one could go on with this, so this is not the opus ultimum, there, there, are, there are more ideas, we can go further, yeah. but for this, and the second, uh, the third thing is of course the flexible wind. So when I had the, the, um, the great joy to play one of the inauguration concerts in St. Martin in Kassel, um, a very complex birth process of an organ. I was in three organ committees, and when they called for the fourth committee, I said, no, thank you. <laughs> I've invested too much time. And then they were, they were successful. <laughs> and also Rieger built this amazing organ in the Martinskirche in Kassel. Of course, the town of the Doc Documenta exhibition. It needs to be a contemporary instrument. And it has the flexible wind, so where you can actually play with very, very little wind on the whole ground dog. In Kassel, how many divisions are there with the flexible wind? All of them. That's really cool. <laughs> of course, there was not space here to do this. But we have it in the ground dog, 
And also, we discussed that very early to have a turbo wind also, to have a excessive wind. So up to 160 millimeters uh, of wind pressure. And of course, many interesting things happen when you have um, a plenum uh, with a too high wind pressure. The, the tuning goes wild and but it still is, it creates a sort of uh, unique sound. Did, did we can scroll up? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you, have, you always have to have new reads. <laughs> um, um, but it's, uh, it's the idea, it's the Stockhausen idea, you know, the Klavierstück 13, where Mayella sits and shoots away these, these rockets from the piano and she counts. Eins, zwei, drei, and she shoots away these small rockets. And I always imagine that with with the organ pipes, that with with perhaps five hundred millimeters, the pipes would go boom. <laughs> but it, it it's that kind of feeling when you play it. Actually, it is it's on the verge, and that it's so wonderful, you know. Some of us have been talking about these things since we were teenagers. And at that time, all the good organ builders declared us for crazy. Now, 45 years later, we are actually working with the finest organ builders in the world. And this, this, is, this is something very beautiful in the, in the history of development of the organ, because people have said, don't touch the organ, it's finished, you know. Don't change the identity of the organ. But through a, the work with experts here, uh, it's been so much, so much fun to, to discuss and to be taken seriously. I mean, this has happened perhaps now for the last 20 years. I haven't been an idiot for longer, you know. But you know what I mean. It's... Uh, so those features you will hear a little bit more in any case. I'm sure you will hear it in Madeleine Isaacson's piece. You will hear it today in Tebuchu's piece. And um, I'm also sure in Beat Tommy. Uh, Tommy Andersson sitting here, the composer of the Grand Concerto, which Matthias Wage will play on Thursday and Friday. Um, that could perhaps be interesting for you if you would like to make a statement how how you have encountered this this instrument because you are of course an also an organ expert and an organ freak as the yeah, uh, or professor of orchestra conducting at the School of Music in Stockholm. Well, I I don't know if I can add so much. I mean, it's been a very fantastic process. Uh, this piece is, in fact, my fifth piece for organ and orchestra. So I was starting to gain some experience of writing for organ and orchestra in combination. And uh, I played the organ myself a lot when I was younger. And I am very much interested in the instrument and I keep very much up to date with what's happening in the organ building world as well. But um, I, I decided to not uh, do too many of the experimental things uh, together with the orchestra because uh, in this case, uh, but um, it is a challenge, uh, and I, I could, of course, I, I, I knew about the theories and the ideas of behind the organ uh, when I started composer, and I knew the disposition. So I, I had a sort of idea what I could use, and it seems, uh, according to Matthias, we are going to meet uh, tomorrow night and work further on this, that it has been possible to realize all these ideas and visions, I hope, that I envisage. And, um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what it will sound with the orchestra, because it, it is a different thing. Mm -hmm. Organ and orchestra is uh, very much a different thing than the organ alone. And surprisingly enough, you might think that the organ is very powerful uh, when you hear it on its own. And then you put it together with a modern orchestra, mm -hmm. and, no. and it very often dwarfs the organ. We are absolutely aware about that, yeah. or we were aware about that. But I'm not worried. When I heard the organ yeah. yesterday, I realized that this is a very potent and fantastic instrument. But that's something the, the organists have to be aware of, because mm -hmm. the, it, it shows that the conductors, for the conductors, the organ is always too loud. 
<laughs> when they are practicing. It's always the same thing. The organ must be uh, more or a little bit more silent. And then uh, the audience is in during the concert. The orchestra will play louder than they played in uh, during the rehearsals. And the, the organ can't do anything against it. It set up everything and it's too soft then. And that happens so many times. We experienced that so many times before. Although, and then critics says the organ is not loud enough, you know. But it's, uh, that's one of the things uh, the organists have to take care of. And here we have the opportunity to work with the, with the general as well. So we can set up the organ slightly close during the rehearsal and then you can you can open it more if needed uh, for the uh, concerts. Well, I agree, and I, I'm not one of those conductors. Uh, I've been so cross with many colleagues that they hush down the organ. Uh, as a composer and a conductor, I, I realize that if, if a composer includes an organ, he wants it to be heard. It has to be loud. <laughs> That's the point. Uh, in, a, in an orchestra context. Uh, but I'm very much looking forward to seeing what effect it will have with orchestra. I, I'm very optimistic and positive. It's a beautiful instrument. And we are also going to hear some of the experimental features <coughs> of the organ in Martin Hersenwerder's composition on Sunday. Sorry, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. And then, Coase, perhaps you would like to add something from your perspectives? Yes, from the uh, we have heard a lot about the sound, the, the tonal concept of the organ and some of the problems of creating an organ in this space. Um, I want to say something more on the technical aspect of the organ too. Uh, you have already heard the Marcus organ, the, 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 the old organ, was an organ that was too big for the space, so it looped. It was the, the space was really used in a rather inefficient way. Uh, making layout of a wind chest can be very simple, but if you do that, in set, if your space is, is so narrow, then you have a problem because it doesn't fit really. So, you know, now the organ is about the same size uh, of the old organ, and you have seen uh, that. The, the, host, the, the space that we use less space than the old organ used. You have seen the organ is full of pipes, but you never have the feeling that it's overfilled. Uh, you can, and, and, and that's the real secret of, of a good organ planning, uh, to make it so that everything fits in it, but everything is good reachable for tuning and for repairs and every pipe has <laughs> enough space to sound, to produce its sound. And that, like all good solutions, looks very simple if you see the result at the end. But I have done organ planning myself in difficult conditions and I know that's a real, uh, that's not so easy. But that's a tragic of good solutions, they look simple. But you succeeded very well in doing that and construct an organ that simply fits and ma doesn't make the impression this is too big for the space we have. And what's even more remarkable, uh, we have mechanical action too. There you have the, the additional problem, everything must be accessed, you must come through between all the pipes and the wind chest for the action and the action should not be too complicated to get there where it, where it should get, uh, otherwise it's, it's, it's less stable and it doesn't work uh, so well, it's, it's heavier and so on. So that's an addition, an additional problem in planning such an organ, and also there they succeeded in a, in a very good way. I thought about mechanical console. The problem always with this kind of organ is you need First of all, a movable console to uh, work with an orchestra. But a movable console can only have electric action. But at the same time, you want to control things. Uh, so uh, we talked about the, the uh, proportional action. 
So we build in this kind of action that really reacts of the key. The, the, the pellet that opens and let wind in, uh, to the pipes opens at the same speed as, as, you, uh, as, as you touch the key. But most of those earlier actions were such that you can say yes, they react more or less, but you cannot say, uh, say they really in a precise way represent the thing you're doing with the key. So you can say uh, how most of those actions are, and your new system does that in a very good way, really follows the, the movement of the key. And that's not simple because you have to, uh, you have, to have a good repetition, you already uh, spoke about that. So it, ha it must be very fast and very slow and uh, uh, work in all uh, circumstances. But we have an additional problem. Uh, the repertoire for this organ is not only the romantic music, where it's very good that the key really react, that the, the pellet reacts like the key. There are also you have also a repertoire that's really composed for classic electrical actions, and classical electrical actions are on or off. There's nothing in between, but they use it sometimes in very fast passages. You have no time really to control it that way. So it should be fast. Therefore, there is the, the second possibility to have the non-proportional action to make it so that it, it opens the pellet at maximum speed. Um, the only disadvantage of such a console is that you have not the feedback you have from a mechanical console, even if you have a proportional action. Although it feels better than you expect you have still some feeling of, of, of feedback. Uh, therefore, uh, we thought it is also very uh, important to have a mechanical console. But there we have the problem, it takes place on the stage, and sometimes you need a place for the orchestra in normal situations. So, uh, we already talked about it, we had to, uh, the organ builder had to develop a device where you can move that console and uh, while moving there should not be a, a, a change in, in, in the mechanical action. It should have be the same tension, it should be regulated and it should stay regulated while moving for, every, the, for the, the action of every single key. So that was really not a simple thing and they succeeded in a very good way to do that. Now you have really a good mechanical action. That are some of the technical problems. Another problem is uh, what to do with the wind. A romantic, we have basically three uh, kinds of organs that we should combine in one organ here. The German romantic organs have large uh, central bellows and uh, not special regulations in between, between the bellows and the wind chest. The French romantic organs have central bellows and have regulating uh, bellows for each wind chest. And in some other organs you simply have not the place to do that, so that they should be regulated more, uh, le much less flexible. That's a disadvantage for the romantic music but an advantage for stability for, uh, the, uh, for much contemporary music. So we have to find here, the organ, organ bill has to find a solution that works in both cases. And that's a very interesting thing in designing such an organ. Uh, the, the whole specification of the organ is so that every stop in this large instrument has its own function that has a, a, a log its logical place. And you <coughs> don't realize that you have a combination of styles in the, the, this organ because everything goes very well together. It's the same thing, I have the feeling, with the whole, uh, whole action and the whole technical part that's designed also in a way that is flexible, you can do many things, and you have always the feeling it fits logical too all kind of repertoire you have to play on this instrument. So 
you did a great job. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. We are just waiting for Joris Verder to come in. He is <coughs> in the building, uh, back from his uh, rehearsal. And uh, so if you just wait a little moment, then uh, Joris can continue. I thought about one aspect. You, yeah. told, you mentioned that the installation had to take place in limited time during the summers. And that um, certainly, to me, uh, occurred as a, a big disadvantage at the beginning. But you said, okay, we'll do it, we'll do it in, in stages, you know. Um, what is your experience with that, thinking about the project as it developed, with the different challenges that occurred and so forth? Um, was it only a disadvantage or a problem? I think it was both a, a, an advantage and a disadvantage. The disadvantage is you give, or we all had time to think about changes from one year to the next, you know. And so that's something, if, if, you, if you design an organ and you build it, then that's it. Mm. If you do it in steps, you always have the idea, okay, we could do this, we could do that. There is still time left to do things. Mm. So that makes it a little bit more complex. The good thing is that... Uh, for us, it, it was always a limited time, even for the voicing. It's very hard to, to keep, the, I wouldn't say the level, but the, I, I don't only know the German word, den, den großen Bogen behalten, to, to not lose the line, mm. the red line, Low, uh, okay. when you work for four or five months continuously. So, this is good. You you have you work for several weeks and then you get, uh, have distance to it and you come back later on. You hear it with new fresh ears, and you can think about it again. You can uh, do small changes and so on. So that's a good thing, I think, on on this yeah. kind of. And I but it's lo logistically it's it's horrible, you know. <laughs> for us, it's yeah. That's what we thought we about have, at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We cannot build the entire instrument because it's too much pieces. We yeah. cannot store them, nothing uh, possible. So we had to build it in, in steps, yeah. really in steps, year by year, which is hard to understand f for the clients that not the full organ is built yet. So we built just part <laughs> of it. Everything is planned, but then it goes step by step. And, yeah. uh, I would like to add here uh, one, one feature or one factor uh, to this, as you have now realized, extremely complex instrument. Uh, I've had the uh, opportunity to inaugurate uh, a rather, rather many organs, and I have never inaugurated an organ that was finished. <laughs> this is the first time on this high complexity level. So perhaps that is, that is a thing to salute extra, yeah. that, that you could actually keep the time frame within these long uh, periods of not being here. So that, that uh, demands an enormously clockwork organization. And um, I would really like to highlight that as now the inauguration is on its way. It's not over yet. So I guess things can still happen. <laughs> uh, because it's living instruments. <laughs> But so far, so far, so good. Um. Yeah, but I remember, Stefan, you said after the first summer of voicing that it was uh, an interesting learning experience. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we have the experience that you can't, um, you can't voicing without any overnotes. Because the big mix about the different styles, the French style versus the German, a little bit the English style, need overnotes, but you don't hear the overnotes. It's a very big difference to make a, a voicing, you cut the mouse for the flute, it's very high, you have nothing overnotes inside. 
So it's very romantic, perhaps, but it mixed not very good. We make the way, we do the way that we cut the mouse not too high, make more nicks, and you have over notes inside. It mixed perfect for all parts of the different <coughs> styles, but you don't hear the over notes. In the space. Overtones. Yeah. Overtones. You're, not, you're not aware of them. Yes. You hear them. That's, you need your noise components. Yes. Yeah. You need your uh, harmonics, mm. but you don't aware. You you don't perceive them as. Uh, Yes. They are a part of the whole sound. Yes, of yeah. course. That was for us a big experience also for the first part and the second part. Mm. And in the first summer when you were here, we traveled down to Copenhagen one yes, weekend for the to also, listen to the Kavikolog and to discuss the, the, the um, one aspect the, the, uh, the, the, that you're talking about, how, how the sound blends. Yes. With, and, and the... the uh, the kind of uh, noise level. Because uh, the, the beginning sound. of the speech of the yeah. pub, yes. But also that is a, a big church with big acoustic yeah. and, and you make the sound is mm. so and here in the concert also we have not very much. Mm. And that is also a difference we have to to change also mm. the, the the voicing style a little bit. We can't make this the same voicing style from Copenhagen. No. It's no. a little bit different. Adjustment, also the yeah. scalings are a little bit more um, um, uh, uh, um, augmented or uh, change it for, yeah. for, for, for the bus region, we take very much more like the Capricorn original bus uh, pipes yes, uh, in, a, in a dry concert space. That's a little bit uh, different to the original Capricorn uh, scalings. Just one little, little ref uh, 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 reflection on the acoustics of uh, the Göteborg concert hall is that I think when we all prepared for our parts on the yesterday's program, we were thinking, oh well, there is some acoustic in the hall. I guess it will disappear tomorrow in the concert. But it didn't. So when I released the first chord in the first rest of, of Apparition de l'Église Atenel, I was prepared to hear dryness but it's not the case it actually it actually behaves the same way without an audience as with an audience and i would say that is on a in a historic building a first mm. but it is interesting because i practiced also some days ago when the orchestra yeah, there's mm. chairs out, and that was a big difference. That will be a difference. Really? Yeah. That, uh, then it felt very dry, but not yesterday evening. No. I agree with yes, that. Mm. I also think there is a difference between your when we are up at the podium and when we are out yeah. in the hall. Mm. That's a big yes. difference. You know. but, um, um, so, so two components, Stefan, that we discussed that I just want you to make awareness of, of two things which I'm, I think really worthwhile discussing and thinking about. And the one is this uh, the, um, in the sustained sound of a pipe, of a tone, the, uh, the noise level. Yes. That's yes. one really important factor, that, it, that it's not too clean, that it has noise in it to, us, to give it life. You know? Yes, but the noises are not disturbed by no. the, the, the capital no. sound. No. You need the, 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 the yeah. noise, it's a yeah. different uh, uh, beginning speech of the different part of stops. Yeah. So for the strings, yeah. also different to the flutes, yeah. and the beginning is very uh, uh, different, and you need the difference of the speech. Yeah. So that's the other of thing: the, differentiation of, the of speech, of the, differentiation of, the, of speech, of the and then the level of example. yeah, yeah. So it's very important. We talked about allowing character in the individual stops, and you did that in a wonderful way. To always. We'll have the flutes in different divisions, the strings. There's always a little character difference yes. between, and the groups of stops, you know, have these yes. main kind of, um, uh, let's say, uh, basic uh, characters that, yes. that belong to these categories in a wonderful way. But I think one of the big challenges, according to the sound, <coughs> was not lose the dark cavicol sound, but still get the power we need. Mm. Yeah. That's very difficult mm. because uh, if you if you make the sound more round, dark, mm. you lose power. Yes, and we needed the power, 
So we thought we it's very dangerous to be uh, not powerful enough. We and have still keep this yeah. somehow this uh, calicol sound. So that was the, yeah. I think that was one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. For, yes, for it us. was. Yeah. But yesterday you played the, the, the E major choral from Frank. You have really in the ears and and. Uh, you, you hear really the cover he called beginning sound mm -hmm. if you play the beginning of the E major chorale, I think. Yeah. 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 And, and one of the things we talked about in the architecture of the instrument, <coughs> we think divisions, um, that in many organs that try to be a combination of, on one hand, French style and German style, and so you find that the Récit uh, is the French division with all the power and things, and the second manual is Germanic in a way, you know. And, and very often we hear too much power and not the character of a lyrical division of, of the récit in the French. So that's something we discussed very much. Yes, very much. We have to make uh, no compromise. The second man is not going to be Germanic. It's going to be integrated in the concept of the caracol. And the third division has to be a récit with a lyrical character. But that was a very important thing we learned this summer, that there are limits for how far you can go in terms of voicing in lyrical style, you know? Yes. And that's where the discovery of yeah. the position of the swell shutters in Kavekol instruments not being as efficient, not as closed and not as open uh, as a contributor in bringing that right, right style, style voicing yes. into, let's say, uh, not a, a more modest kind of uh, loudness, if we express it so, by not opening the shutters completely. So that's the solution was not what we thought music and musicians, you know, to keep it down. The solution was more to find out that the position of the shell shutters could be altered and changed. And when we put it to, we talked about approximately 60% open. Then we felt, okay, the hierarchy between the reed choirs of the organ work and the, the scaling and the voicing, the natural voicing of the reeds, <coughs> uh, the reed choir and the, and the reci just was fine. You know? yes, yes. So that's yes. another learning experience in the process, for, for me at least. And yes, of course. Yeah. Yes. Probably it's important to say you can store it. You have a French mode now, mm. a button with French mode, which uh, doesn't close completely, it still remains about 3% or 4% open. Mm. And if you are on full open position, it's about 60% open, according to the normal use of the shutters. So you can choose it and you can set it in the system. So, so that's what I used in Funk, for example, yesterday. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So then I can operate with the swell shutter fully open, but it doesn't open more than the 60%. So the balance between the divisions is kept in, in, in clavicle mode. Yes. Very helpful. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask Joris, who just arrived after practicing, uh, to add something from your perspective. Yeah, thank you, Paul. I hope arriving that late that I don't say too many things that have been said already. I apologize for that if it uh, should be the case. Um, I would like to say something uh, again about this, our choice uh, to take a Kavaiko model for the organ. and. Um, I think um, as, a, as a principle for a concert hall, you today you have to make a new beautiful organ anyway. I don't think it makes much sense in a concert hall of today to make a reconstruction of whatever style. I mean, we have to proceed and we have to make a new organ. In, in this case, the concert hall, you know, it's from the 30s, but it has changed a little bit and we are different people in the 1930s, so we have to implement also all modern technologies together with a, an, an image, a purpose we have, a basic sound. Uh, the sound of Kavei Kol um, is something which is there in the air. Everybody talks about Kavei Kol and everybody has this idea about Kavei Kol. Although there are a few uh, objective parameters and uh, we have been talking uh, about that um, and to come back to what the discussion of just a minute ago about the noise factor and the different speech of the different stops I think that's a very very important um, element of this Carré Col style or in general the French symphonic style um, 
we uh, experienced that uh, many times <coughs> when we visited uh, Col organs. Uh, when you have a combination of different stops with a different noise factor and a slightly different speech, it is this combination is, I think, the condition to be able to play in an expressive way. Um, try to imagine you have only one stop, um, let's say a flute. The flute is perfectly harmonized. Every pipe has the same speech, has the same noise factor. Then when you play like that one stop, it's very, very difficult to make a kind of expression in every note. You can just calculate or uh, control the length of the note, but you can't, can't do anything else. Once you add other stops, because of the change or the difference in speech and noise factor, every tone is a little bit different. And in this transition from one note to the other, there, I think, is one of the secrets of this uh, typical carré cold sound. It explains also for, I tell you, you are probably all organists, I suppose, or know something about the organ. So it explains, I think, why um, there, there is a difference in registration practice, for instance, um, for a solo. When there is a solo in a Vidor, Vidor symf symphony, oboe solo, it says oboe. Au bois. Uh, Widor was a rather severe um, organ player that we know from. Franck, it's not au bois, it's au bois fond, trompette au bois et fond. So foundations with the trumpet and with the oboe. And that allows the player to ha have a more flexible sound by itself. Um, I think it's, it's a very important thing which was. Um, achieved here in this organ. I think the, the organ makes that uh, very well possible. And that is one of the living elements of, of this organ. Um, you don't have the impression that you have a cool modern organ, just like uh, any um, modern or digital electronic instrument. It is a living instrument because of this um, vitality in every stop and in every speech of the separate stops. So I think that's one very important thing. The other thing is more theoretical, that's about the choice of Carré Col. Um, why Carré Col? Um, I think, well, um, the French symphonic style has um, been uh, accepted in uh, many countries in Europe, and we, we realize <coughs> that the French symphonic style makes it possible to play much, much of the repertoire without um, many cons concessions. But on the other hand, the philosophy of Carré Col is uh, maybe more important than its, or its, its organ, so to say. Uh, the big, the most beautiful organs by Carré Col are also organs that are set in a historical context, in a historical setting. Saint Sulpice. And that's a Carré Col organ, but he uses the church, he uses the case, and he uses quite a lot, uses quite a lot of the, of the pipe material. Uh, the same thing in Saint Tuon. Uh, the same procedure. So there is always a connection with history and an opening to the future. Explains also where that no uh, two big organs by Carré Col are the same. The small organs there have. There are models, but the bigger organs are always different. On the other hand, when Carré Collet, uh, later in his life, speaks about his most beautiful organs, it is striking that uh, concert hall organs come on the first place. Um, I think of the Brussels Conservatory, which is a three-manual uh, organ in the concert hall, uh, way smaller than this concert hall, but still 32 foot, uh, etc. Um, Carré Col considered it, this to be an ideal organ. So um, that also is a kind of argument for us to have chosen this Carré Col model. 
this connection with, with history. Um, it also uh, explains, uh, <coughs> at least uh, to my opinion, why we really did want to have also a mechanical console. Um, it could have been a much cheaper solution and much easier for Rieger to have only one console, I suppose, I'm sure. Uh, but the, to have this um, mechanical console is absolutely necessary um, for a player to have a total control in the, that kind of repertoire where, uh, of the symphonic music. I mean, um, I don't think it's so important when you play with an orchestra or a choir, it's maybe less important, but for solo concerts, it's so important when you um, play that French repertoire to have a kind of direct mechanical control. Even in Cabaret Call Organs, there were Barker machines, pneumatic assistants. Um, <coughs> a pneumatic assistant is still something different from an electri electric or a digital action. So this um, physical connection with the sound is extremely important. And I experienced it very clearly here. So we had, um, when we came before, only the uh, digital movable console was installed. And it was really beautiful to play on that organ. It had great facilities, it was really nice, good control because of the proportional action uh, that, and the choice with the digital action it was fantastic. But when I came here on Tuesday night, night, Tuesday right? night and the mechanical cons console was, was playable, I immediately felt that was still something else. Uh, and it's not only the, the, the thing that you control directly, but what is very important to my feeling is that when you're sitting there uh, close to the organ, you feel the organ answering immediately. You feel the vibration in the keys, so to say. And you get much more, I, myself, I get much more inspired for that, at least for the French symphonic music, which is what I'm going to play, um, than playing the, the other console, which of course has facilities which you don't have on the, on the, on the mechanical console. But all those things together make um, that this organ is complicated, it's a complex mechanism, but I think every feature of this mechanism um, has its argument to be there. And it's done in such a way uh, that whatever you want to play, I think you can play it with great satisfaction. That's um, at least my experience till now. Um, the, so the, the link with history is, to my feeling, very, very important. And also the opening to the future. The experiments with the flexible wind have to, have to start only. Also the proportional action, which works in a magnificent way. It will find its um, use. Um, and then there is the possibility of the electronic connections, which we have to explore for sure in, in the future. So that are a few ideas of my, my impression of this organ. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, I think we have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, I have a technical question. I, I, am I wrong if, if I guess, guess, guess that it's a second set of pallets for the proportional action? No. It's the same same palette. Impressive. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yeah. Uh, when it comes to voicing uh, of this organ, have you used nicking or? Yes, yes, a lot of yes. a lot, lot of, of, lot of A lot of nicking. And, and the mechanical uh, console has that got uh, Walker machines? No. 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 Yes? no. Uh, we have a we have a pneumatic assistor, assistance uh, in the winches, but it's not it's not a classical Barker machine. It's we call it balanciers. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, you have the possibility to adjust uh, the pallets, 
with the pneumatic uh, system, but uh, it's not, not the classical Barker. Yes, uh, could you tell me about your ideas, and is uh, the organ in co uh, cooperation with the choir, the sound or something like that? Well, I, th I think the, the, um, we haven't discussed that very much, okay. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, let's say, the, the wide range of dynamic possibilities yes. with the symphonic organ mm -hmm. uh, is one of the things that you really need to accompany and, and work with choirs. So um, the nature of a symphonic organ with these uh, extraordinary dynamic possibilities that we have with the general swell and everything, and, and the, let's say the efficiency of the swell divisions by themselves, um, uh, provide us, I think, with an instrument that is going to show uh, to be very uh, uh, useful for choral accompaniment as well. And we're actually talking about next festival to have um, the regional weekend, we have the marathon concert next weekend coming up with the 49 municipalities and organists from all over West Sweden coming here and playing the instrument to also have choirs involved in that. So we'll experience and explore how the instrument actually works in choirs as well. Thank you. I'm also a member of the Gothenburg Symphony Choir. Yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to making the instrument useful for you too. Uh, another quick, quick technical question, if it's possible. To get of course. A technical answer. The tuning of the saxophone with the variable wind pressure, that must affect the free tongue and the flute in different ways. And I'm wondering, uh, is the flute so lightly voiced that we, it, it, uh, it is not significant? Or how does, how does that work? Is that is there a short answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. <coughs> but, it, but it's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, actually, actually, the the flute will will uh, <coughs> has its range, of course, because uh, through the uh, uh, change wind pressure, it, it changes the pitch, of course. But the, the uh, free read gives you the impression that it's still in tune. So this it, it keeps it together. That was our experience when we did the tests, and so we thought, yeah, it will work. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, you have two coupled resonators, and the one helps the other. Yes. If you do it the right way. If you don't do it the right way, then... But you have yeah. to voice and to yeah. tune it together. You can't yeah. tune and voice only one part. No. It works together. Yeah. You have to voice yeah. it They influence only together. each other, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm a member of the Gothenburg Symphony Orchestra. Uh, I was uh, at the concert yesterday, and I, I was extremely happy and proud of, of what I heard. And also what I saw, visual. So I, I want somebody to say a few words of the light design of the organ, which I found extraordinarily beautiful. Mm. Mm. Uh, I, I could maybe take it back to discussion we had with uh, the um, head antiquarian of the uh, preservation authorities in West Sweden. When we um, approached them, Higab and, uh, uh, and the Organ Academy as project leader, uh, the, we needed permission to install an organ in this preserved space. And uh, Lena Imonsen then said, I understand that we have to be a little bit flexible with a concert hall like here in Göteborg, although it's protected. If the symphony orchestra needs an organ, it needs to be installed in such a way that, that it doesn't destroy or disturb anything of the architecture, but yet it would be important to to also see the new instrument. So there was a lot of care involved, you know, to make the podium wall again one surface, like the whole architecture of the whole. So the generals will actually enhance the architecture of Nils Eina Eriksson. And the new Baldakin canopy was shaped in such a way that it really blends very well into the original architecture. But then, like she said, also, it should be allowed 
that we can see that the new instrument is there. There is a new dimension to the concert hall given, and that's where the visual possibility appeared as, as uh, something attractive. And, and to have lights inside the organ room was something that we saw and knew that you had done in Paris as well. So we thought, let's go along with this and try to do something in Gothenburg uh, that gives us a possibility to visually uh, sense and see the instrument. So you did it? No, yes. We, really. Yeah, we, we installed it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. We choose the places, it's ten, yeah? Ten. ten. It's ten, ten uh, lights placed in, mm. in the all, uh, in, in, the, in the organ and they can individually be uh, coordinated with colors and everything, so. Okay, thank you. Yes, the question about the flexible wind. Uh, how do you adjust that when playing, or can you adjust it while mm. playing? Yeah, yeah, you have a, you have a, a, a crescendo pedal. A crescendo pedal. One, one of the crescendo pedals is only for the um, flexible wind. So you can actually do phrasings with... Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So on the short film you maybe saw that big weight yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, move this well pedal for that, it travels off or on maximum, uh, thereby changing the weight uh, uh, on that uh, uh, bellows. Okay. Questions? Yeah, no. Uh, maybe a technical question a bit, but uh, you mentioned the, the new technical solutions with, with the proportional um, action, um, as well as the mechanical keyboard or the mechanical console that you can move up and down. So I was just wondering, is it many new patents you have to give in in order, or did you use something that already exists? No, we couldn't use something which existed already, so this is uh, based on new ideas and new materials and, and uh, created from scratch. Yeah. We never did something like this before. Mm. Also, the proportional key action system is the first... Uh, stop, stop action system is the first we ever did. Yeah. We did the proportional key action system a year ago. That was the first project in the Vienna uh, Cathedral. Yeah. I'm just a little bit curious. Is it uh, kind of as, is it a completely new way of um, making giving a solution that, or making it technically happen, or is it uh, like an improvement? Of something that no, it's completely new. We did it in a completely <coughs> different way than the other systems were. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, congratulations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. Is the uh, old Marcus uh, already relocated? No, the, it's stored um, in uh, it's in a storage place in the northeast, eastern Gothenburg, and uh, we had some discussions that seemed to have um, potential, but then the pandemic came. And uh, uh, it needs to find a new place, there needs to be money, a new hall, something, and nothing is developed since the pandemic descended on us. So we'll see what happens in the future. A second question is the lights in the organ, is that controlled by the organist too? No. no <coughs> we, did, we did that in Paris, but then they... Took it, it. Changed it, uh, took it out, and they they wanted to have the control in the control room, <laughs> <laughs> and, not, and not leave it up to the and not leave it up to the organist. <laughs> I was thinking about the mechanical action as well, um, and I heard that you installed wires that helps um, making it possible to change the position of the board. But um, I would like to hear both the uh, view of the organ builder as well as Rodis who played on the <coughs> like all the organs who played on the mechanical board with a does it feel in a different way? And I know that it works in a different way because you replace the abstracts with the wires, but how does it feel when playing on it? Is it a, another different feeling of 
of touch. Um, I, I know, talking to Daniel, that there were some issues to figure out. How satisfied are you with your solution? So it's, it's a two question, which I like to get into the discussion. Yeah, as, as, a, as a player, I would say um, there are, when you play a mechanical action, there are many, many different feelings of a mechanical action, but you feel it's a mechanical action. And I think there's the same thing here. There is, um, it, of course, the feeling is different than, uh, let's say, an 18th century action where you're this nicking point. Um, but still, you have the feeling of, a, of having a direct control with, with the palate, with the organ. And so it, it plays in a very, I find, very easy way. You, you feel the keys. And um, so I think when you play a mechanical action, you, you never calculate, like sometimes on electric action, uh, where actually the, the, it's on off or on. Right? And so that makes it very comfortable. I don't know, Hans, how you can uh, you play it also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree. It, you have a good sense of, of haptic response and contact, and that's what you want to have. You in an action. Feel the pressure point and yeah, 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 yeah. You do. And yeah. how much is the the um, well, it, it is very. Let's say the the long distances, you know, um, between the 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 console and the different divisions, and taking that to in, into regard, I think it's uh, it feels very. Uh, it goes quite easy actually. It's when when you couple. Uh, two divisions to the main, then it's, it's of course, then you feel the, the, the weight that you need. So I sometimes use, when I have that kind of texture, like tomorrow, tomorrow night, Sunday night, uh, in a Toccata kind of texture, then I use one mechanical coupler and one electric coupler to, to make it balanced in that sense, you know, so. Mm -hmm. But I think it's playing with a wonderful sense, like Yuri said, it's a, I'm so happy we have that console. And I think that was a point when we discussed the possibility at all to do this. Um, we, we now talked about the problem that we can't have a console permanently placed on the podium because the orchestra needs the space. That was one challenge. So to have a console that can be lowered was necessary. That was one thing. The other problem was, like Vandalin mentioned, the limited space behind the panels and that we couldn't change anything in the hall <coughs> since it's, uh, it's preserved, you know, it's a monument. Uh, so. You said, we can manage uh, to the reference group, we can make it happen, but only if we can use new materials. Would you give us the, 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 uh, the confidence to do that? And we unanimously said, yes, we know that if somebody can manage to use new materials and do this, Rieger is, is going to do it. You know? So it was also, we are going to succeed with it. And, and so it's also, it was also a necessity. There was no option to make Barker machines. There was no option to have wooden trackers because of space limits. So, could could you give us a perspective from Riga about the technology in your experiences so far? The most difficult thing was, first of all, the space. It's not only the limitation between the panels and the and the uh, concrete wall, but also the space underneath the winchests. We wanted to keep the uh, ground org winchest and pedal winchests as low as any possible uh, because otherwise we would have lost a lot of, of um, sound opening on the general swell shutters. And of course, if, if you lift up the first winchests, the others will be affected too, the, the three divisions behind them. So we, we kept them as low as possible. So we have only uh, about, uh, I think it's less than 40 centimeters left for all the trackers running underneath the uh, ground org and, and uh, pedal division. So we, we thought about a different way how to do this and that was with this uh, new material. And uh, the distance between the trackers now is three centimeters. They are running on, um, nine levels with three centimeters distance. So it's 27 centimeters for all the trackers, the height. 
I'm perhaps also adding that the, the wiring is, of course, super high-tech. Hmm. I mean, it's not, it's not like the wires <coughs> used by von Beckerat in the 60s. I mean, this is, this is, <laughs> this is super, super new material and very, very convincing and extremely stable. It's better than wood, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's not okay. living, though. <laughs> yeah, one more question? Yeah, uh, maybe it's a funny question, but, but uh, the twin chests, are there common slider chests? Yes, yeah. absolutely. All of them. Apart from the, from the um, extension chests, of course. But the, all divisions are classical slider chests, yes. And of course, I guess that there are more than one pallet uh, in, in some uh, areas. So yes, yes. Yeah. Up to four. Yeah, up to four. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And because the balance says it's not too heavy. Yeah, <coughs> four pallets for one tone, and to make that proportional, that's yeah. really impressive. Okay, perhaps one last question. If there is one. Yes? How did you get the huge pen pipes in under the floor? Didn't look like there was much space. <laughs> <laughs> that was really a big challenge. <laughs> that was so right. Yeah. First thing, there, there was a very small hole. I think it was you 50, know, it by 50. 50 by 50 centimeters. That was the entrance to that space. That was enlarged, as we could see in the video. It's about 1.3 meters now, and but we we cut uh, the or we made the pipes in in two parts, and we put them together right at the place. Yeah. And two people did this the whole installation in mm -hmm. a little bit more than a week, <laughs> bringing all these parts. The, the the foyer was full of these space pipes, you know, things, and then. Uh, I was visiting every other day, you know, and it was <laughs> <laughs> and getting into the chamber. And I would like to just tell something which was fascinating to see with the Riga team of organ builders that uh, um, you have many young people coming in, apprentices and people working with you, and experienced, very skilled workers. And uh, you let them work in teams of two very often. Mm -hmm. So one experienced and one who is learning. And to see the dynamic between the two in these two teams was fascinating all through, all the time, to see how there is a transfer of knowledge, how there is an input of energy, and how there is this kind of, uh, you know, it was fun when we had electricians come and carpenters from Sweden, you know, it was like, half the speed of the Riga <laughs> When the Riga people came in in the morning, everybody knew what to do, you know, and it was like they were running to the things, and now everybody working and like this. And the Swedes were taking a little coffee break. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an, an enormous efficiency and, you know, the pride and, and, and uh, involvement and responsibility. And Michel Nussbaumer, who made the, the, the panels installed the canopy and was in charge also of the base pipes. Uh, incredible people you have. And, and uh, so a lot of admiration for that. I'll tell them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's also why you find in the program book yes. all the names yeah. of the people who actually made the organ. It's so important for us. Uh, uh, like I said last night, if you, if you want to have new friends, build an organ. And I really feel that all these people who built this instrument for us, with us, our friends and part of the family that made this dream come through. So um, we can express it in some ways and that's why we have, for example, all of you that participated named in the program book. If you want to learn more about the process and some of the things that happened along uh, the road, uh, we made a documentary which was released 48 hours ago. You can find it on the home page and, and on the Facebook. It's about one hour, five minutes about the project with interviews and, you know, different places, reference group members, organ builders, you know, you can see the process of the last five years. Uh, Jung Linason uh, did that documentary. Okay, thank you very much.
and so, uh,